Panther people, what's going on? I'm going to be talking about what I think the Panthers are trying to tell us after watching Panthers Confidential. You're watching Panthers Post with Phil Perkins. Thanks for joining. Uh, okay. Shout out to the content team with the Carolina Panthers. They know it's kind of a lull right now in terms of the NFL when it comes to content, it comes to breaking news. So they dropped this at the perfect time. About 25 minutes, super crushable uh, Panthers Confidential. You can watch on YouTube. You can watch on their website or their app. Again, I'm not getting paid by the Panthers. I'm just saying shout out to them because they know there's not much to talk about right now besides you know some rookie mini camps, seeing guys in their jerseys, picking out numbers and all this jazz. But they're giving us actual things to talk about and things to break down and to overreact about. Pretty on the nose and very telling that they had former left tackle Jordan Gross be the narrator for this Panthers post. Not only because he's a Panther great, he's in the ring of honor, but also he was their last real good left tackle. And that kind of led very nicely into them picking Ikemi Kwanu out of North Carolina State with sixth overall. And I will say, now I'm probably reading way too much into this. I'll give kind of take you behind the curtains here. I have a science degree. I have a science degree that I don't use anymore. But I took Psychology 101, I took Sports Psychology, and there's something that Ikemi Kwanu is doing that I don't know if he's aware of is doing it, but he's picturing himself at a certain situation. He's picturing himself um, succeeding at a certain task. Now, he talked about he, he obviously is a Charlotte guy. He wore 704 on the chain. Uh, he has been a Carolina Panthers fan since time. And he has a great photographic memory. He was, They actually had him walk through the stadium of Bank of America uh, and the end zone seats right there. I've sat there as well. Awesome seats. Shout out to Cliff. Um, but he kind of like broke down each scoring play, each big play during the NFC Championship game in 2015 against the Arizona Cardinals. You know, he talked about Luke Keekley's pick six. He talked about Ted Ginn's uh, scamper for a touchdown. Talked about Cam Newton doing the Superman right in front of him. And he talked about how, you know, that was an amazing experience, number one. And number two, he talked about how now that he's a Carolina Panther, officially, uh, how I'll put aside here, how amazing is that that the Panthers have been around long enough now that they're actually drafting players who grew up watching this team. Remember, they came out in 94, 95. You know, there were some people already established NFL fans, whether it's, you know, with Washington, Dallas, Buffalo, Pittsburgh. But now you got guys who are growing up, literally looking up to Cam Newton, Luke Keekley, Christian McCaffrey, Greg Olson, looking up to those guys. And you now have a fan on the team, and I talked about it before. That is a huge asset that money can't buy. But anyways, back to the picturing success. He talks about now how he wants to win a Super Bowl with the Panthers. And to get to that, he said, you have to win the NFC Championship game. And so he thought it was valuable that he actually saw it happen right in front of his face in real time, the Panthers winning the NFC Championship, kind of putting himself in that helmet, in that position. And so now he's like, okay, I've already mentally been there. So when I get to that moment, it's not going to be a big deal to him. He's not going to freak out, even if it were to happen if he was a rookie. My goodness, if that happened, that's wild. And so the next step would be to go to the Super Bowl and to win the Super Bowl. Now that brings me back to Russell Wilson, who people are now comparing Matt Corral to a little bit because who drafted him and at what point in the draft. But Russell Wilson lost the NFC Championship game before the Seahawks won the Super Bowl. And what did Russell Wilson do right after? Like, you know, a couple weeks after losing the NFC Championship game, he was in the Super Bowl. He was watching it as a fan in the box. Why, you may ask? He said to reporters he wanted to visualize himself at the Super Bowl as if he won that NFC Championship game, then going to the Super Bowl and then hoisting the Lombardi. He was visualizing it, visualizing himself doing that. And what happened the very next year? Won the Super Bowl. And so it came getting a bit, not even knowing it, a bit of that Russell Wilson playbook and visualizing in his brain when he was a teenager winning the NFC Championship with the Carolina Panthers as a member of the team. And the next is the Super Bowl, which I hope he hoisted Lombardi one day, and I'm sure he will. You know, there's obviously some things that they don't talk about during, you know, Panthers Confidential about the draft. They don't talk about Baker Mayfield, Jimmy Garoppolo, Sam Darnold. They don't talk about those guys. They just talk about the prospects. The point of this program is for them to get you and me hype about these rookie class, which obviously we are. And so when they talk about a certain quarterback, number nine, now that we know Matt Corral out of Ole Miss, they kind of go back eight days before the draft. They have their war room, you know, that Bank of America Stadium in the war room, Scott Fitterer running the show, just giving a lowdown of the prospects. And it seemed to be a consensus uh, with the Panthers scouting staff that Matt Corral was their number one QB on the board. Number one QB. This is not 
during draft night, be like, ah, oh, this is the guy, I guess. You know, he's number one right now with who's left. He was number one on their board ahead of Kenny Pickett, ahead of Malik Willis, ahead of Ritter, ahead of all those guys. And so you hear Matt Rule say, and I'll, I'll talk more about Matt Rule later, but you know, Matt Rule talks about, you know, watching the tape with, with Matt Corral, it's the most convincing uh, tape that they have. And it kind of makes sense. You know, he played in the SEC, played with a big, a, in a big program against big time competition. Alabama, LSU, Nick Saban. I, I read in the Alabama News, like a local Alabama News, they were about to play Ole Miss last year. And Nick Saban talked about what it's like to prepare for that offense. You know, that Lane Kiffin, you know, shoot him up offense. And he talked about how Matt Corral, this is Nick Saban, arguably the greatest college coach of all time, saying Matt Corral is the hardest quarterback he's ever had to game plan for. This is a guy who's played against Joe Burrow. He's played against Cam Newton. He's played against, well, not Tua talking about, oh, he, he coached his ass. But he, he's he's coached against these guys. And he said Matt Corral, current Carolina Panthers second string quarterback, I'm putting it there right now, was the hardest quarterback they ever had to scout for. And so it makes sense that it's the most convincing because you can always poke holes in everybody else. You know, Kenny Pickett, small hands, played in the ACC, which is a very, very, very good division. But, you know, he's a five-year starter. You know, it took him some time. This was his only really good year uh, as a starter with the Pittsburgh Panthers. Malik Willis, transferred out of Auburn, had some issues that he admitted to. Playing at Liberty, not top-tier talent. Uh, Desmond Ritter, playing really well with, with Cincinnati, ha- elevating them to the, you know, the college football playoff. Uh, but still, Cincinnati is what it is. He didn't play against great competition during the regular season, but Matt Corral kind of checks all those boxes. And then you have Ben McAdoo, who we've talked about in previous episodes. Check those out, that he is a whiz when it comes to analyzing quarterbacks before they get to the league. He gushed over Patrick Mahomes, tried to trade out to get Patrick Mahomes. The guy loves, even though he doesn't look like a very uh, athletic dude himself, I'm sure he's very strong, got some dad strength, he loves dual threat athletic quarterbacks. And he talks about how Matt Corral could be a unique athlete quarterback for this team. He says he loves his athleticism. He says the ball pops out of his hands. He can pull the trigger whenever he wants. He is exceptionally accurate. That's what Ben McAdoo says. He says he loves this kid. He says he could be very unique. He loves his athleticism. What else do you need to know? And then also the uh, Ryan Day Excuse me if I get the name wrong. I'm pretty sure it's Ryan Day. Uh, coach Day, the quarterback's coach with the Carolina Panthers. You know who coached the likes of uh, Deshaun Watson saying that Matt Corral's ceiling compared to everyone else. This is including Malik Willis. He has the highest ceiling out of that quarterback class. And he said that he could be a franchise quarterback. And this again, before, eight days before the draft. They they don't know what's happening. They, everyone still thinks there could be maybe one or two quarterbacks taken in the first round. Malik Willis could somehow be the second overall pick to the Detroit Lions. Okay, so people are still pretty high on these guys. And so um, they're not justifying, you know what, maybe we could still take him in the third or something like that. Um, so... They felt like he could be a franchise quarterback. And the fact that they got him in the third round didn't have to give up too much. Next year's third, which could have been valuable, but either way, um, to get Matt Corral in the third. And they were justifiably hyped to get their number one quarterback, albeit what you make, you can say what you want about this quarterback draft, but the number one quarterback in the room, they got in the third round with the 94th pick. That's pretty amazing. If Sam Darnold struggles in the first couple weeks i'm saying if they start zero and two and it's all his fault matt corral's in week three like i know i was saying you know the week 14 or week 13 by week man it could be earlier than that because i think ben mcadoo and him got a great relationship and a great rapport and him and matt rule the same deal i think that could happen sooner than we think a couple personality things that i noticed um you know matt rule seems to be getting very comfortable which is good I don't know if he's comfortable because he's he's entering his third year as an NFL head coach or he just doesn't give a F anymore. Um, there was a scene where they were kind of re- trying to recreate how they nailed the first couple picks in last year's draft in Panther Confidential. And they kind of went in there and they're him and uh, Scott Fitter, who definitely seemed to have a great chemistry with each other, uh, kind of walking in, kind of mocking that whole scene and talk, you know, talking to the camera, knowing that it's there. Um, but he just, he just seemed to have more of a personality than, well, we know he has a personality, but he seems to be more nonchalant that we thought he would be for a guy who we all assume is on the hot seat. So he seems pretty relaxed, which I guess is a good thing. I'll also say there was a lot of talk entering this draft that, you know, Scott Fitter is running the show. Scott Fitter is running the show and no doubt 
He is running the show. You can see he's running the war room leading up to the draft. But when it came to draft night, Matt Rule was doing a lot of talking. He was doing a lot of talking, talking about how he loved Corral, talking about, you know, the trade for Corral, talking about, you know what, this is what we do it right now. We're going to do it right now. He said he was kind of praising Scott Fitter for being patient up to that point. And then when the moment came, like, you know, we got we to pull the trigger right now. We got to do it. And then they did it. And then, as we mentioned before in previous episodes, check it out. You know, Matt Rule on the phone with Bill Belichick, the greatest professional football coach ever. And he's talking to him, wheeling and dealing, saying, oh, next year, second. No, 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 no. We're not doing that. Scott Fitter agrees. All right. He calls Bill Belichick again. Okay. We're going to give you a third and uh, this year's fourth for this year's third and 94th pick. Okay. Done. Write it up. That wasn't Scott Fitterer. That was Matt Rule wheeling and dealing with the greatest coach of all time. So shout out to Matt Rule for completing that and looking better. And again, take everything with a grain of salt, but looking more confident and not as, you know, uh, dead man walking as we may have thought he would be entering his third year in a must win, must succeed situation. I guess when David Tepper said, hey, it's a five year plan. We've always said that with each other behind closed doors until right now. I told everybody. Maybe Matt Rule doesn't feel the pressure at all, and it's all just us. He's feeling good. Another person that I thought was pretty interesting, uh, they didn't have to put him in, but they did, uh, was Steve Wilkes. Steve Wilkes talking to Ike Aquanu when he walked into Bank of America Stadium, the uh, the front entrance there. Such a calming presence. Uh, definitely a guy who, who has been through it. You know, been through as an interim head coach with the Panthers, a head coach with the Arizona Cardinals, dealt a horrible hand, treated absolutely unfairly, gassed, and then back here in Carolina. You know, he's a guy who's seen some things, and I think, despite the fact that he's coaching DBs, uh, and Icky going to be, obviously, a left tackle, maybe he could be a safety on a blowout wins or something, I don't know. But he seems like a coach that I feel like everybody, no matter what position they are, could go to and talk to about life. And I'd love to talk to Steve Wilkes just about life. He was just such a such a cool dad figure um, and I think, yeah, I think he's going to be a humongous fit. And if it happens that Matt Rule is somehow gassed in the season, I see Ben McAdoo just staying as the offensive coordinator calling plays and Steve Wilkes being the head coach because, look, he's talking to left tackle drafts that he's – draft prospects that he's never going to coach. Um, but, you know, when you're the head coach, you're the CEO of the team. And – yeah, I could totally see if Matt Rule gets gassed at some point in the season, Steve Wilkes is going to be the interim head coach yet again. And I think the players would be okay with that, just seeing how Icky reacted to him. Check out Panthers Confidential. Let me know what you picked out, what you pointed out, what you what you noticed, uh, maybe be- reading between the lines in that video. It's awesome stuff. I hope they continue to do that because, hey, more content for us until either they trade for Baker or, or Jimmy or when preseason starts or when training camp starts. All about training camp. Uh, but, yes. If you're new here, like, subscribe, comment below. See you guys next week.